Why, hello there, and welcome to Watches Live, episode five. Folks from around the world, this is the show where I take you on a tour of some of the best selections from our watch box inventory. If you have not checked out our new website, open a new window, keep me streaming, and check out the watchbox.com, the best way to buy, sell, and trade watches. I promise you, it's a million times faster than watch you want ever was with better selection and everyone's favorite feature, the new arrivals page, where you can try to beat me to the next JLC minute repeater we bring in. In any case, tonight we have a fantastic selection. I decided to go Omega Heavy, Omega Manic, precisely because I know it's a favorite of the field, and we just haven't talked much about Omega on this program in the past. So I'm going to jump right into it with a watch that could be considered either part of the quintessential family of Omega watches or the bad boy and deviant of that family. It's the 2015 Bet Noir, albeit in white, it's the Omega Speedmaster white side of the moon. Now hear me out, this is my favorite of the moon variant. It's still the same case size that we know and love from the gray side and the black side. 44.25, the watch is absolutely blinding to the point that I ha almost have trouble showing it to you. It's all white ceramic made by Commodore, which is Swatch Group's specialist in stones and ceramic components. Now, if you look closely, this watch has a fantastic subtlety to it that you could almost lose if you didn't see it in person, so let me facilitate. There's a fantastic metal deposition about the circumference of the bezel. It features alternately brushed and polished case flanks. So on the flank, it's actually brushed, satin finished. It looks bleached on camera, unfortunately, but there is a contrast when you see it in person. And the bevel along the case flank is all of high polish. Now on the dial, which is also white ceramic, you have both black calibrations and red shocks that really pop against the black base. This is where the watch really comes into its own because the black on white makes for outstanding legibility. Turn it over and it is the Spectacular Caliber 9300. Why do I call it Spectacular? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First and foremost, this is the most accurate family of mainstream chronograph movement that I know of. We had a question the other day during Monday Mailbag regarding the most accurate watches I've ever encountered, mechanical watches. And I had to think about some esoteric movements. I've seen Zenith Dayfi Lab. Uh, Brian actually showed me some camera video of that that he took in Switzerland. Of course, there have been some experiments like there was a regulated tourbillon from JLC that made 47 seconds of deviation per year in a contest in 2009. But routinely, the caliber 8500 coaxials and 9300 chronographs put up the best timing that I've experienced in a mainstream watch. How good is that? Well, I've seen 0.5 to 0.3 seconds of deviation over 24 hours on a chronoscope. Yes, it's that good. 60 hour power reserve, George Daniels designed coaxial escapement architecture, and of course, you've got both a column wheel and a vertical clutch for precise actuation, smooth and precise resetting, and of course, that crisp tactile touch of the column wheel itself. And of course, this being part of the 8500 and 9300 family, it has a gorgeous arabesque coat with blackened screws that are unique to this movement family. All right. Friends out in Watchland, I see Lucien is joining us from Bucharest, Romania. That's where I got my JLC Snowdrop. Outstanding service there. I can recommend that uh, that dealer if you want to go offline. They did well by me. Also, Vincent Tan saying hi, Tim from Tokyo. Thanks for getting up at an awkward hour to watch us, Vincent. Most appreciated. Also, Robin Rickett joining us in from London. Thank you for staying up late to watch us. And Nolan Reed, well, Nolan is in Atlanta, so he's in my time zone. My friend all the way down I-95. Okay, so let's talk about the other ceramic Speedmaster that I've got. I think this one will be more to the liking of the field. In my opinion, the white side is the most unique of the sides, and by, the, by this time, there must be as many sides to the moon as a dodecahedron. I, I think we've run out of sides, thanks Omega. But the gray side, in 2016, received this remarkable refinement, the addition of a hybrid ceramic and sedna gold bezel with a meteorite dial. Now this is the gray side of the moon case, meaning, and this is where you can really see it to good advantage, the differential finish is 
on display in fantastic fashion, not evident in the white side. Here you can see the satin finish, which is achieved with diamond-tipped tools, as well as the metallic-style polished bevels. This is where Omega's ability to work ceramic really comes into its own and sets itself apart from what's out there. Of course, Omega making its own ceramic at Commodore within the Swatch Group, it gets an excellent grade and finish. Now, the dial is spectacular. This is the Widmann-Staten preservation process that first brings out the grain of the iron meteorite and then stabilizes it so it will never corrode, it will never oxidize and lose that definition. It is essentially frozen in time like a metallic snowflake. Now the great thing about these is that they have a mono counter. I'm going to show you this. Hopefully you can see, hopefully I've wound the watch enough. But when you start the chronograph, the counter at 3 o'clock is both chronograph hours and minutes, so you get that vintage style dual register dial and the cleanliness that it brings, but you get hours, minutes, and seconds on your chronograph. Now, I mentioned the vertical clutch. What does that do for you besides a smooth stop and start? Well, it allows you to run the chronograph continuously. So if you prefer center sweep seconds to go with your minutes and hours, simply leave it running. It'll need to be worn daily because you won't get the standard 60 hours of power reserve from the twin mainspring barrels if you run the chronograph continuously. But thanks to the vertical clutch, there's also no additional wear and tear on the caliber. A distinct advantage over a traditional lateral clutch. Of course, still the caliber 9300, still that unique finish. Now, it's both coaxial and a chronometer, which means very accurate. This is a highly refined caliber. Now, the coaxial 8500s, the 9300s, and their Matas certified master chronometer successors are all as tough as the earlier 2892s, 7750s, and 2824s. This is the coaxial come into its own as a movement, accurate and tough. Plus, with a silicon SI14 hairspring and balance, it's also amagnetic, not anti-magnetic, amagnetic. All right, folks. So this is a question from Hachi Zenki. Is this ceramic or Omega's proprietary cermet? This here is true ceramic. What you see here is a ceramic case and a ceramic case. Which is to say, they're very durable on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't want to beat these like you might a no-date sub or a Bond Seamaster, but these do have the scratch resistance that allow them to essentially shake off anything but a killing blow. So scratches, scuffs, minor marks, these watches will not show them, as the case is effectively as hard as the sapphire crystal itself for practical purposes, very durable watches. Just, again, know yourself, know thyself. If you are inclined to put dents in cases or chip sapphires, then these are probably not for you. That's okay, we have other Omegas for you. But before we talk about Omega, I wanna go back to where I'm from, which of course is my mono brand fixation with Chegeur LeCoultre. Now back in 2010, it's hard to believe it was ever absent from the catalog, but in 2010, the automatic Memovox, three hands and a date, returned to the catalog in the form of the Master Memovox World Time Limited Edition. Stainless steel, 40 millimeters, it recapitulates the old World Time Memovox references from the 1950s and 60s in style, but with a vocal caliber 956 automatic inside. Now, it was a limited series of 750 pieces. I have to say, Omega really has nothing against this. There's an Omega alternative to almost every complication on the table tonight, but the alarm watch right here is not just a house specialty of JLC, but one to which Omega really gives you no alternative option. So let me fire it up. I've got my lav mic on here. When I show a memo vox, I should also sound off a memo vox. Now this is the modern caliber 956. Hmm, I might have to do a little bit more. I'm usually pretty good at intuiting when it's fired. That's about one third of the alarm power reserve right there. I didn't want the thing to just keep going and going and going, but you can hear the distinction much better than the old 918s from the Master Compressor Memovoxes and the Master Memovoxes of the early 2000s. This one has tone, volume, and sustain. This is like, 
This is like one of those American Fender Stratocasters, the really good ones that you have to pay a lot more for, or a custom carbon. Okay, so I will say this. If you're not looking for an alarm watch, I've got just the thing. Go into the absolute top of the heap, Jezure LeCoult, once again, a watch for which Omega has no alternative, so given my Omega Mania theme tonight, I can show this watch in good conscience as a non-compete. This is the Duomet Cantiem Lunaire. Now, the Cantiem Lunaire followed the standard chronograph by about four model years, but here's the thing. Can we go back to the macro? This model right here, in the 40 and a half millimeter case with the reprofiled domed bezel debuted at SIHH 2012. And in my opinion, this is the case size for the Cantiem Lunaire. It's more elegant, it's more stately, it's not as sporting as the chronograph complication, so it appears more natural in a smaller case. Closer coupled, the twin dials are also more logical in their layout, and here's why. Because on the crown side of the Cantiem Lunaire, you have the time. On the crown side of the chronograph, you have the chronograph. What does that mean in a practical sense? It means when the watch is peeking out from underneath your shirt cuff, on the lunaire, you can see the time. On the chronograph, you can't see the time. You can only see the chronograph. Now this watch was dedicated to chronometry. Precision, pure and simple. This will match the performance of those 8500 series Omega coaxials. And it does so because one mainspring barrel on the case back and you can see both of them here, one mainspring barrel exclusively operates the balance. All it does is maintain balance amplitude for 50 hours of power reserve. The other mainspring barrel operates all of the functions of the watch, such as the complication showing the moon phase, the complication showing the age of the moon, the complication showing the date, as well as seconds, sixths of seconds, hours and minutes. And you can see twin power reserves at the bottom of the dial. Now let me show you how you synchronize this watch to a reference time. My nails, unfortunately, are not what they were. But the first thing you do is you pull to the intermediate stop, and that will bring the seconds hand to 60. Pull it to the second stop, and it does the same thing for the one-sixth of a second foudroyant. You synchronize the watch not just to the second, but to the sixth of a second. That's the Duomet Contiem Lunaire, rose gold, solid dial, 40 and a half millimeters, German silver movement. We're going to call it by its, its French name, Maishore, because we are not in Glasuta. We are not in Saxony here. This is designed to emulate the Valet du Jeu pocket watch style of the 1870s and 1880s when this dual movement was first proposed by the watchmaker Victor M. Piguet. Okay, folks, so I'm going to be picking winners tonight. I forgot to mention, we're giving stuff away. We're giving away hats. So as we are entering the winter season, you need something to keep your immaculately coiffed head warm. And I'm going to help you out with Breitling, Roger Dubuis, and Rolex caps. What you need to do to enter the contest is send your name, your address, and your phone number to tim at thewatchbox.com. We're using my email tonight because the old one wasn't working. We've changed our emails. We are the Watchbox now. We're not what you want. So send your emails with your name, your address, and your phone number to tim at thewatchbox.com, and I will be picking winners routinely. In fact, let's see if anyone has sounded off. I'm looking at my email. Okay, some, some names are coming in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys the opportunity to stockpile a few names and get a few, uh, few names into the hat, so to speak. Let's continue with our theme, but instead of talking about Speedmasters, let's talk about probably the most undervalued name in the Omega catalog. That is DeVille. Why is DeVille special to me personally? Well, because it's often the experimental name. The first coaxials were introduced in the DeVille line in 1999. We also saw the first hour visions featuring the 8500, the first 
dedicated coaxial caliber architecture in 2007. And in 2005, we saw the first coaxial ratropomp in the DeVille family. I have that hour vision from 2007 and that coaxial ratropomp on the table tonight. These are watches that held me spellbound when I was a paralegal working my first job in mortgage-backed securities law right out of college. And the watch I would go to see at the Tourneau on top of Penn Station, it's closed now, was the original Omega Mega DeVille Hour Vision, resplendent in black, red, and rhodium plate. This dial was absolutely mesmerizing, elegant, balanced, unique. To this day, it looks like nothing else. And the Hour Vision nomenclature makes sense as the watch was one of the first to incorporate sapphire as a viewing port in the case. That's right, this watch was the beginning of sapphire case components. Now you see them on everything from Richard Mill to Grubel Force to Zenith and beyond. Of course, Hublot has done many series, but in 2007, it was the Hour Vision, debuting that revolutionary 8560-hour dual mainspring barrel coaxial chronometer caliber with that distinctive arabesque coat, the blackened screws, the full balance bridge, the free-sprung architecture. This watch was the launch platform. Now this watch cost over $7,000 in 2007 money. Today, it's an absolute steal at under 4,000. If you want a watch with style, panache, and an important spot in Omega's historic catalog, you want this watch right here. Finish what my heart started in 2007. Bring this watch home. It deserves it, and it deserves your respect, it deserves your affection, and it deserves its spot in the history books. Now, a watch that I would consider most misunderstood is a model that came out in 2005 and was absolutely my Omega watch before the, the DeVille Hour Vision. This is the one I wanted. This is the one I dreamed of. This is the watch I saw on my wrist trying to visualize whether it would fit my wrist a million times during my final two years of college. Now, back then, this watch cost $13,700. This is the stylish, one might even say, vintage Baroque Omega DeVille Ratropont. It came out at Basel World 2005. There were a couple of dial variants. The steel watch with the black and the white with the red and blue accents is the one you want. At the center, to die for luminescent alpha style hands. Flanking, unique sub-registers that show the time for the chronograph, yes, but also a bi-scalar constant seconds register at nine o'clock. Now the triple date, it, it later became something of a sports watch cliche, but in the beginning it made a lot of sense and it debuted on this model line. You saw it across brands and across models later in the 2000s. Here, the idea is simple. Show three dates, so even if the minutes hand is covering, you're able to see the succeeding and the preceding date, and therefore, let me get some Ratropont action going here, therefore you're able to essentially gauge what the date is, even if the date is covered, because you can see proceeding and succeeding. Now, the watch has a remarkably wrought case in steel, 1950s style stepped lugs, double fluted bezel, and on the case back, this is an Omega coaxial column wheel vertical clutch chronograph caliber. It is a chronometer. It has a 54 hour power reserve, and it's based, it's also free sprung. A lot of toys in here, guys, and 100 meter water resistant. It's based on the Frederic Piguet caliber 1286, which is a thicker and tougher version of the 1186 split second Frederic Piguet used by Blancpain and others. Now, what you get here is Omega's coaxial technology. You get a longer power reserve. It's been brought out from 40 with the standard Piguet to 54 with the Omega. Instead of a mobile index, you get a free sprung balance on the Omega. And of course, you get a unique treatment with blued screws, linear coach de Genève across the winding mass, and then something I rarely see in Omegas, usually see in Zeniths, a perlage pattern across bridges rather than the base plate. It's as beautiful on the reverse side as it is on the dial side, and that's not something you can say of all automatic chronograph calibers. In a world dominated by the Valjoux 7750, this is a sight for connoisseur's eyes. I'll also say this, guys. 
This watch is now an absolute bargain. What cost $13,700 in 2005, now I believe costs, I, I wanna say we're offering this watch for under $6,000. An absolute buy. This is a ton of watch for the money. Remember, a steel ceramic Daytona today costs over $12,000. Nowhere near what this 13,000 plus watch cost in 2005. That was serious coin back then and a different echelon of horology. That's Omega toying with high horology guys. All right, let's take a quick look at the, oh boy. Okay, we've got friends. We've got friends from all over the place. I am picking a winner for a Rolex cap and that Rolex cap is going to our friend, Nolan Reed. Nolan Reed of Atlanta, Georgia. You sounded off in our chat box. You sounded off in my email. You're getting yourself a Rolex cap. As I like to say, whether you bleed green or you simply need green to provide for friends this holiday season, I'm going to spot you a freebie, a stocking stuffer, all for your lonesome. This is a Rolex cap. It's got a convenient Rubber pull tab with a Velcro adjustment on the back. Rolex specs only the best on your wrist and on your head. Nolan, congratulations. All right, guys, keep sending your name, phone number, and your address to tim at thewatchbox.com so I can pick my next winner. Okay. So now I was talking about these watches. I was talking about watches that represent a fantastic buy. I, I should correct myself. It's just under 7,000 for the Omega Coaxial Rattrapont. There's some room for negotiation. Give Josh a call. All right, let's talk about something not Omega, but still chronographic. We go from the Rattrapont de Ville to an FP Journe 38 millimeter brass caliber Octachronograph in rose gold with white gold dial. Now these are exceptionally scarce. Made between 2002 and 2004, you won't see many of these brass caliber octachronographs, period. Now they have a five day power reserve that FP Journe himself admits will run for seven days, not five, but with isochronism and precision for five, thus the five day rated reserve. They feature FP Journe's chronograph module and they feature a flyback chronograph functionality such that you can reset and restart with a single push of the trigger. FP Journe's emblematic double disc grand date, white gold dial, bolts on the dial in FP Journe's style that he popularized. He was first with screws on the dial, guys. Credit where credit is due. How many ways is this watch discontinued? Well, as of 2007, the Octa Chronograph was discontinued. As of 2004, the brass movements were discontinued. And as of 2015, the 38 millimeter cases were discontinued. I can tell you this watch, based on the case codes, was made in 2002. I can tell you the case was made in France because F.P. Journe used to use a Paris-based case supplier named Eleanor from his days as a pocket watch custom maker to about 2008 as a maker of wristwatches. F.P. Journe watch cases were made in France, double hallmarked with the French Eagle and the Swiss Saint Bernard, brought over to Switzerland for final assembly. This watch is not just an F.P. Journe chronograph that looks sharp on any wrist. This is a historical document and an important combination of discontinued factors from arguably the most influential and significant independent watchmaker of the modern age. That's a watch you can have for around 42,000, but good luck finding another one if you pass on this. Now, I should mention, it's not all about F.P. Journe. We're going to go outside of our comfort zone. We talked about Parisian case makers. Why don't we talk about watches made entirely outside the cozy confines of Switzerland? Well, we don't have to go too far to the town of Glasuta in Saxony. During the Middle Ages, they were known for silversmithing and glass blowing. But after 1845, thanks to F.A. Langa, they were known for watchmaking. And this is one of the most intriguing modern references from possibly the best known of the East German watchmakers of the modern day, Glasuta Original. Officially the company that is the heir to all of the trademarks, copyrights, and history of the original Alanga Unzona. The current Alanga Unzona was established by the Langa family and Gunter Blumlein with special accommodation from this company. Now the watch you see here is the Senator Perpetual Calendar. It debuted at 
Basel World 2011. Uniquely, it's a steel perpetual calendar with a rubber strap, durable, versatile, and affordable. You're getting an entirely hand-assembled watch with a black varnished dial made in Glasuta Originals. I believe it is a Forsheim located dial factory that they own. So they make the dial, they make the case, they make the movement, and it's a caliber 100 base with twin mainspring barrels and a 55 hour power reserve. You can see the Glasuta striping across the bridges as well as the winding mass. You can see the black polished swan's neck fine regulation device, and I would be remiss not to do a better job of polishing up this sapphire. My apologies, guys. The movement features the emblematic double spiral reduction wheel for the winding system. 55 hours of power reserve. It features a unique zero reset system on the case flank. That's what the smaller of these two pusher adjusters achieves. It's effectively a flyback mechanism that acts on the seconds hand of the watch. Now, if you want a steel rubber strap, $13,000 and change, handmade, hand finished, hand regulated complication. This is the entry point to high horology, guys. Aperture perpetual calendar, the way I prefer it. I don't like radial arrays, even though my grand Memovox features them. I prefer to see my day, date, and month in apertures. It's simpler, it's more logical, and it makes for a more orderly and less crowded dial layout. This is a perpetual calendar to die for, guys, from a brand with absolute manufacture, provenance, integrity, and credibility. Okay. It's not my only geo, though. I would say that the Senator line is a stalwart in Glasuta Originale's catalog, but if I were to say they have a modern day icon, something that defines the brand as anything but stolid, stodgy, and well, take every Teutonic stereotype you've ever heard. This watch is not that. This watch is fun. This watch is fashionable. This watch is a little bit avant-garde and all Glasuta. This is the Panomatic Inverse. Now, the original Pano Inverse debuted, the Pano Inverse XL debuted at Basel World 2008. This watch debuted in 2014. It's automatic winding. Unlike the original, this 42 millimeter rose gold watch features automatic winding, which is more practical on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, some might say a big gold watch with a dial side escapement and duplex swan's neck regulators isn't an everyday watch, to which I respond, it's the man that makes the watch, not the other way around. You need panache and confidence to wear this, but could you wear it every day? Absolutely. All the fun of the movement is on the dial side. Glasuta stripes, absolutely, you've got them. From 12 to 6 and back again. Blued screws, present and correct. Kiln fired and heat oxidized. Hand engraved, balance bridge, you've got it guys. Hand engraved, no two are exactly alike. Black polished, double or duplex swan's neck regulators, you've got it. Panorama datum, double digit date, it's all there, and it has an elegant double-stepped bezel that nicely pairs down the visual mass of the watch with fine finishing in the form of double finish, satin and polish when viewed in profile. If I had to show you one watch, if you were an extraterrestrial, one watch that represented what Glasuta Original does best, it would be this. All right, friends, friends and watch family in the chat box. Let's see who's going to win next. All right. Captain Zed, you've been with us forever. Ken, congratulations. Out of Texas. What you're winning, because everything's bigger in Texas, and everything's biggest at Roger Dubuis, the Genevois Richard Mule competitor. Let's see if we can do a quick close-up of this watch. Everything's bigger in Texas, and everything's bigger at Roger. You're winning this Roger Dubuis hat. Now, this one is beautifully made. It has an embroidered brim, triple tone, in that sporting black, white, and red. It's thick, it's burly, and it features that same high-quality Velcro adjustment on the back that you find on the Rolex caps. This is also very thick canvas, an impressively made hat for an impressive brand that is doing great things to revitalize its star in the Richemont era. This is going to you, Captain Zed. Thanks for following us since forever. Like I said, some of these viewers are almost like family to us. All right. So moving on through our 
I would say, embarrassment of riches. I'm going to get back to Omega, but I want to talk about Zenith. A watch that came out in 2012 and was gone from the catalog by 2015. What you've got here is the Zenith El Primero Espada. Notice anything odd about this dial, folks? Rose gold, 40 millimeters, beautiful cocoa sunburst. But this is not a chronograph. Reprising a name from the 1970s, Zenith boldly took its 10 beat per second El Primero caliber and crafted a fine, stylish, and versatile time and date automatic. Now, it still has the 10 beats per second, 36,000 vibrations per hour. It still has the preternaturally smooth sweep of that hand. It still has the 52 hour power reserve, but what it also has is an elegance and a balance you will never find in a chronograph. If you want the heart, soul, and I should really say the heart beat of an El Primero, in a watch you can wear anywhere with anything, with gorgeous facets, nuanced dial, applied rose gold indices and hands to match, you want to consider this 40 millimeter Zenith El Primero Espada, a watch that originally retailed for over $17,000. Now, if you have to have your El Primero with all the toppings, I have an option for you. Happily, vintage inspired and beautiful in blue, this is the El Primero Chronomaster 42. Now, we featured its 38 millimeter counterpart in the last Watches Live. This is everything you expect. It has the classical triple registers overlaid from the A386, exquisite blue sunburst center, concentric circles outboard to a tachymeter scale, the tachymeter scale giving way to a beautiful box section sapphire that's gorgeous in that it creates a little bit of plexiglass off-axis distortion and expensive to make in that any cambered or box section sapphire costs an order of magnitude to make than more than a flat sapphire. Beautiful to behold, a premium feature. It's matched to a simple but stylish case. You can see it features double finish, satin finished on the lug hoods, polished on the flanks, as well as the bevels. This is a watch that's easy to wear on a small wrist. Paired with a beautiful navy blue alligator leather strap, it features a rubber inlay on the back that's smooth against the skin and also bodes well for the longevity of the leather as it's isolated from sweat, grit, and moisture on the wrist. It's capped off with a double deployant trigger actuated clasp for security and insurance against droppage while donning or removing at bedside. Okay, so let's see, are there any questions? I am taking live questions too. That's part of the fun of Watches Live. It's interactive. Okay, so I see Aria is commenting that the Chronomaster Heritage 146 Brown reminds him of this Espada. I, I can see the Espada being reminiscent of that. This watch again is defined by that sunburst cocoa dial. I don't know if it's gold, brown, bronze, chocolate, or a little bit of all. This is an elegant and striking sunburst, the likes of which Zenith rarely reprises. Okay. So, question. Are there any 5 hertz movements coming out of Switzerland, or is it exclusive to Germany and Japan? No, there are 5 hertz. 5 hertz is 36,000 vibrations per hour, which means your Blancpain Bathyscaphe flyback chronograph is a 5 hertz movement. De Bethune does 5 hertz movements. Zenith, of course, does 5 hertz movements, and it's on the tip of my tongue. There's another one that does 5 hertz movements. It'll come back to me. But there are, there are a few doing this, and, and I should say it's no longer rare, and Breguet has gone even farther than that. They now have a 72,000 vibration per hour chronograph, the Type 22. Okay, moving on, let's talk about high horology now, and let's talk about real refinement and pedigree. Let's talk about something that arguably no one does better. In 2012, Ulysse Nardin, with its bi-directional perpetual calendar, modified its well-known trope to create the El Toro Perpetual Calendar GMT. 43 millimeter is nominally part of the executive line. It features a ceramic 24-hour bezel, a rose gold case in 43 millimeters, pusher adjusters, that allow you to independently actuate the GMT function, you can control the day, the date, the month, and the year, which I should say is actually hidden right underneath. If I can unscrew this crown for a moment, I'll show you how this works. You can set the time anytime you want. There is no danger zone. Set it forward, or I should say the calendar. Set it forward, set it backwards. You'll note, as I set it forward, the month 
at 3 o'clock will jump to October from September. By directional calendar, this one can be reset by hand in the year 2100, and it features a manufacturer caliber with silicon hairspring, silicon escapement, automatic winding, and a unique finish. There we go, guys. Perfect. You lease Norden inside and out. You don't have to be a Russian oligarch to wear this one with style. And gorgeous Cote de Genève across the dial. You can see the characteristic T of the El Toro line. Since 2012, the bigger, the bolder Ulysse Norden perpetual calendar, still bi-directional and with convenience of that second time zone for world wanderers. All right. And by the way, guys, I remembered the other Swiss manufacturer that's doing 36,000 vibration per hour movements. Parmigiani. All right, guys. Let's see. Rodriguez or Rodriguez 2707 is asking, is there a risk in some movements if you go backwards while adjusting the date? Yes. Most are not good at that. I would not do that on almost any watch. Some GMT watches and bi-directional perpetual calendars, which means basically Moser, Ulysse Norden, Grubel Forsey, Unless you have one of those and you know it's bi-directional, don't set the watch backward through the date change. Again, travel watches are usually pretty good about this. Watches with GMT functions, if they're modern movements. Be careful on an older watch, even if it is a dual time. And on any three-hand time watch, try not to set it backward through the date change. That's usually a great way to get yourself a big repair bill from Switzerland or Glasuta. Now I promised you watches from beyond the bounds of Switzerland and let me show you one of my favorites. One of my all-time favorites from a name I know and love, you know and love, and everyone respects without qualifiers, Grand Seiko. This is the limited edition SBGA 105. A 2014 limited series of 539.9 millimeters in steel. This is the SBGA spring drive automatic, SBGA 105 limited edition. It has a beautiful sunburst blue lacquered dial, diamond polished hands, and Grand Seiko hands require loop examination. They're that good. They're the best hands in the business, and that's including companies like Lang & Heine that hand manufacture hands. That's how good they are from Grand Seiko. Now the watch features the characteristic Zeratsu finish, which means it's not just polished, it's optically smooth polished. When you get a Grand Seiko steel or high intensity titanium case, you're getting a level of optically correct polish that's executed by hand. What else is executed by hand? Well, all the indices are placed by hand. The hands at center are diamond polished and satin finished by hand. And inside, the watchmaker built watchmaker regulated caliber 9R15 spring drive is a handmade caliber. Now what does spring drive mean? It means you get quartz precision with motive power from an automatically wound mainspring. It's accurate to within 15 seconds a month. There is no battery in here. There's no capacitor. The spring turns a dynamo that creates induced current that alternately speeds up and slows down that regulator wheel. Guys, can we get a little closer with the macro camera? as in as close as we can possibly get. It doesn't tick, it spins, which means it moves continuously, which means the seconds hand that is geared to it also moves continuously. This is the only smooth sweeping seconds hand in the world. Breguet's Classique Chronometry and Type 22 don't achieve it. The Bulova Precisionist doesn't achieve it. No El Primero achieves it. What you're seeing here is unique to Grand Seiko and one esoteric reference from Piaget. 72-hour power reserve, handmade watch, handmade movement with Grand Seiko's spectacular spring drive technology. Hacking seconds, dial side power reserve indicator, my all-time favorite, one of 500 made and the very best of what Japan has to offer. Okay. Question from Mads K. Is it expensive to get spring drive serviced? No, it's no worse than any Rolex or Omega. You're going to pay somewhere between $900 and $1,500 typically. The difference is it's going to take a trip across the Pacific. Okay, so Rodriguez2707 is saying if it doesn't tick, if it doesn't tick and it doesn't talk, 
Well, then it's neither fish nor fowl, which means it may be something spectacular if you are open of mind and heart. And believe me, Grand Seiko Spring Drive appeals to the heart. So let's talk a little bit more about Omega, because we're getting towards the tail end of our show, and I promised you Omega Mania. What I'm also going to give you is one of the best options in modern dive watches. This is the Planet Ocean 600 meter coaxial, 42 millimeter, ceramic bezel, 42 millimeter, titanium, lacquer dial. This is the best watch you can buy in the dive class for under $4,000. Consider that a no-date sub is going to run you $7,500, a sub with date is going to run you about $8,550, and you can have this with a longer power reserve, a silicon hairspring, proprietary coaxial technology, and, despite the 600 meter diving depth, a display case back all in highly wearable titanium with the luxury and conversation starter of a helium escape valve. It also has incremental adjustment built into the clasp in the form of a best-in-the-business milled-out dive extension. You can, you can wear a sub, or you can buy the thinking man's alternative. And to be perfectly honest, my first luxury watch was an Omega Seamaster 300 meter. I'm partial to the brand. I love the brand. And I'm a Seamaster guy through and through, despite being too skinny to swim without getting cold. I would take this over a sub any day of the week. But if you want complication, and you're not afraid to go big and bold, in 2013, Omega, under the guise of doing something good for mangroves in Southeast Asia, gave us the Seamaster Planet Ocean GMT Good Planet in what was then a unique 43.5 millimeter steel case. Now it's a standard Planet Ocean case size, but I think it's a just right size. The 39 is too small for me. The 42 is fantastic, but in a GMT, you've only got this one option, so it's a good thing that they chose a versatile one. Blue ceramic bezel with lacquered numerals and indices. Coaxial chronometer. Dual time caliber inside. Bidirectional rotating bezel. Now, here's the thing, guys. This is a watch that you can have for... Well, let me see. I think I've got a, I think I've got a price list for this guy somewhere in here. The Good Planet is under $6,000. In fact, it's under $5,500. Now, it originally had a retail over $8,100. And in excess, I would say $8,950 is what you're going to pay for a Rolex BLNR. Buy this fully depreciated. Enjoy the extra legibility of the bigger dial, the extra functionality of the 60-hour power reserve, and the uniqueness of the blue, white, and orange color scheme and set yourselves apart from all those guys waiting in line to buy a used BLNR or a year plus to get them new. Absurd. Buy this now, wear the more distinctive watch that's mechanically just as accomplished and far more unique. You'll never see another. For me, luxury watches are all about the experience and the more special the watch, the more special the experience. That's why I would take that over a BLNR any day of the week. Not to sell, to, to own. I buy my watches to wear, not to sell. If you buy your watches for emotional appeal, I find this one is warmer and more appealing than any Rolex. But if you want Rolex, but you still want value, and you don't want to wait in line, I've got a black and blue Rolex family member that you can buy now. And that's the Tudor Heritage Black Bay Blue. In-house caliber, chronometer rated, blue bezel, stainless steel, this is a watch that could be considered the anchor of Tudor's post-2007 relaunch comeback. Although it came out at Basel World 2013, you could argue that it was at that same time, 2013, when the brand relaunched in the U.S. and really hit its stride, that Tudor came back not as a junior Rolex, not as a cheaper Rolex, but as a brand worth collecting in its own right. A collector pursuit, a path that need not lead to the gateway of Rolex, but to fields beyond, passions and pursuits unknown to Rolex collectors. That's what Tudor gives you. With vintage style and this watch under $3,000, 70-hour power reserve, silicon hairspring, chronometer rated, it's all the dive watch you'll ever need, all the character you'll ever need in a collectible, and all the luxury you'll ever need in a mechanical watch, all in one reference for under 3000 bucks. Okay, so how should I conclude tonight? 
Well, I've talked about Omega, I've talked about Zenith, I've talked about Jejer LeCoult, I've talked about F.P. Joran, Glasuta, and Grand Seiko. You know what we hardly ever talk about? Even in the context of giving a little bit of love to the DeVilles, we never talk about constellations for men. And I'm going to end on that note, because this constellation double eagle chronograph is probably the best Omega you never hear about, and I mean never hear about. This model line launched in late 2004. It was essentially an update of the Grief or Griffin Claw 1982 Omega Constellation Manhattan design, which was popular in East Asia and popular with women, but lost its historic following among men with a 54-hour coaxial chronograph caliber 3313 in here, you've got a titanium case that measures only 45 millimeters lug to lug. It's a very easy watch to wear on a small wrist, but a solid 41 millimeters across the broad of the case. Versatile and ultralight in titanium. This is a 2009 special series dedicated to the Omega Mission Hills Cup. Can we show that? It's a little bit hard to capture. Let me apply my requisite polishing cloth and see if I can't give you a little bit more clarity. Can we do better with that, guys? There you go. Okay, that's as close as I'm going to get. It was a special Chinese market competitive golf event, and the constellation, uniquely loved in China, was issued in this memorable matte titanium carbon fiber dial coaxial chronograph. 100 meters water resistant. This is a ton of watch for under $4,000. This is as good as the constellation gets in the modern era, in my opinion. Masculine, memorable, rare, and special. I'm going to choose that watch to close out our session. But before I do, I want to reach out to all you guys who are joining me live and emailing me at tim at thewatchbox.com to enter our drawing with your email, your address, your phone number, and your name. Okay. I can see that... Fernando Sanchez, you are our winner. And you are a winner of the Breitling hat. Like a Breitling watch, this one's heavy enough to leave an impression. Beautifully embroidered, it features characteristic Breitling navy blue, white shocks, Breitling logo, foundation date, and a clamshell style adjustment featuring the Breitling B logo. Congratulations, Fernando Sanchez. I do need you to send me your mailing address so I can spirit this away to your cozy confines. Folks, thanks for joining me tonight. This has been a fun episode of Watch Live, our fifth iteration of this special feature. I appreciate everyone who sounded off, everyone who emailed in, everyone who chatted in our box, forwarded a question. Thank you so much. I'll keep doing these forever if you guys will keep watching. There's nothing more fun than a tour of high horology and find folks with whom to share it. Thank you so much. This is The Watchbox. I'm Tim. They're the Amigos. And thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.